My name is Lowell Tesfai. I'm, an, I'm a senior advisor with the Center on Education and Skills at New America. And I just want to thank you so much for joining day one of the PIA Youth Apprenticeship Summit. Our next panel, Adapting Youth Apprenticeship in Response to COVID, will focus on how intermediaries, education leaders, and employers are maintaining youth apprenticeship programs in the face of school closures and work disruptions brought on by the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis, and how student apprentices are navigating through this new climate. We've seen that with the Great Recession and other economic downturns of the past, youth have been the hardest hit. And because youth are oftentimes crowded out of quality entry level jobs, they're more likely to have higher rates of unemployment and for longer, which can translate into a reduction of lifetime earning potential and other problems that we know can have an intergenerational impact. But youth apprenticeship has always provided a solid and important connection to work in school, a connection that will prove even more important as our country looks to ensure an inclusive and, economic, and equitable economic recovery. Over the last several months, we've seen many examples of how youth apprenticeship employers have shifted to remote work and supervision to minimize disruptions to on-the-job learning. We've seen how education providers have redesigned learning environments so that youth apprentices can continue to earn credits and industry recognized credentials and advance in their education. And we've also seen how intermediaries have established new protocols and offered additional supports to youth apprentices so that they can continue along in their career path. And today we'll hear about some of these program innovations from a group of excellent speakers. Today, you will hear from Brianna Allen, who is the Director of Student Pathways for the nonprofit organization Horizon Education Alliance. HEA is based in Indiana and serves as an intermediary organization that partners with employers, local educators, and community leaders across Elkhart County, and they have helped launch five different youth apprenticeship programs to date. One of their employer partners is ChemCrest, and so today we have Travis Meyer, who's a manager at ChemCrest, a logistics and supply chain employer based in Elkhart, Indiana. In addition to procuring goods and um, services related to maintenance, repair, and operations for ChemCrest, Travis is responsible, responsible for supervising youth in the ChemCrest apprenticeship program. And one of those youth is Graham Neer, who's an apprentice at ChemCrest, as well as a senior at Northridge High School. As a project manager apprentice, Graham is uh, learning the ins and outs of logistics management, including tracking inventory and production to shipment and delivery. And we're excited to hear his perspective as a, a youth apprentice here today. And last but not least, we have Melissa Stowasser, who is the Assistant Vice President of Community Partnerships at Trident Technical College, which is one of PIA's national partners. Melissa works with public and private high schools, homeschool associations, employers, and community partners to develop and provide seamless educational opportunities for students in the Trident region. And since 2014, Melissa has been engaged in developing and implementing the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program. Who, who we, what we, we've heard about them today, and we've heard a couple of, uh, from a couple of their apprentices today, and we're excited to hear from Melissa. So before we begin with some questions, I just want to remind the audience that um, you can feel free to drop, drop questions that you have for the panelists in the Q&A box um, on your Zoom screen, and we will try and get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, but to begin, I just want to kick it over to Melissa. Um, so you could tell us a little bit about your youth apprenticeship program. Who are your partners? Um, what sort of pathways are you offering youth? And generally, how has your apprenticeship operated before COVID-19 hit? Okay, thank you. Um, we love to talk about our program, or I'm more than happy to share. Lul can attest to that. Um, we were very, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, because when Boeing came to town, they terrified our local manu manufacturers as they were pulling all of the talent from our region into their employment. And so we were working with employers across the region to do adult apprenticeship programs and have been doing so for about 40 years. And we were approached by one of our German based companies about the possibility of starting a youth program, because they knew that in this new environment, they had to do something to create a talent pipeline strategy. And so in that space, we had the opportunity to pull partners together 
to create a regional collaborative partnership that really moved to design the programs for students. And so it is a collaboration of entities, all of our local school districts, our local employers, um, the college, of course, the Chamber of Commerce, Apprenticeship Carolina, who's a statewide intermediary, philanthropic organizations who pay the students tuition and that's all partnered together to create the Charleston Regional Program. And now they hire, our employers are hiring 16, 17, and 18 year old students across nine different industry sectors, ranging from the manufacturing groups that started it to healthcare, IT, business, even um, pre-law enforcement. So nine industry sectors, we have 18 occupational pathways right now. To date, we've had 351 apprentices hired. We currently have 108 and we're excited about that in the midst of COVID. Thanks for sharing, Melissa. What about you, Brianna? Could you tell us a little bit about the different programs that HEA has helped stand up in recent years? Absolutely, and thank you all. We're excited to be here this afternoon and share about our youth apprenticeship program uh, that has launched in Elkhart County. Um, currently, we have uh, five different pathways in which students are able to access for youth apprenticeship from advanced manufacturing, IT, healthcare, financial services, and we work with um, all of our school districts. There are seven uh, school districts within Elkhart County, ranging from rural all the way to urban. And so um, this opportunity came about for us to launch Youth Apprenticeship back in May of 2019. So we're still a little new to the game um, when uh, we partnered with CareerWise Colorado. And so you hear quite a bit about them during this conference, but just kind of leading those efforts along with Charleston and others in the youth apprenticeship space. Um, you know, we have local partners, employer partners. We work closely with our Chambers of Commerce, our Economic Development Council, um, our local community college, our state workforce board uh, in the state. I mentioned CareerWise Colorado and um, you know, there's, there's a larger effort in the state of Indiana um, focusing on youth apprenticeship and really approaching it from a systematic approach through uh, the community of practice, um, which is being led by a couple of organizations down in Indianapolis, Indiana. So all of those partners, all of those efforts are really um, enabling us to really uh, bring about youth apprenticeship. And Brianna, I know one of your employer partners is ChemCrest. Uh, they were one of the first employers to sign on and to commit to hiring youth apprentices in Elkhart County. Uh, so Travis, I want to turn it over to you. I want to understand a little bit why uh, pre-COVID during a period of record unemployment did your company decide to launch a youth apprenticeship program and, and how, have you, um, how had you structured this youth apprenticeship before COVID hit? Um, yeah, um, Chemcrest is uh, is a company that's always been involved in our community, um, takes an interest in our youth, and um, just trying to do our part to be a good, you know, uh, corporate citizen um, here where we where we work, live, and we play. Um, so when this was brought to our attention, um, it was a no-brainer that we we wanted to get involved. Um, I think from probably at, at that point it was to um, just definitely to be involved and to to build up our our youth um, and to to help you know um, to help our future workforce. Um, Kim Crest, like I said, always always wants to give back, um, and I think like I said, that was just an opportunity to to bring somebody in and. Um, possibly be um, an opportunity for us for a uh, future full-time ChemCrest associate. If that's not the route they take, um, we've done our part to help develop, um, to develop our youth, you know, to get, to give back to, to our community or wherever they may decide to go. Thanks, Travis. Graham, as an uh, uh, employee at ChemCrest and one of their first apprentices, I'd love to hear from you. What really drew you to the Youth Apprenticeship Program? So what drew me to the apprenticeship program actually was I planned on graduating early, uh, junior year actually. So I doubled up my classes, kind of prepared myself for that. And my 
two older brothers previously went through the work-based learning or work experience route during high school. So I've kind of known a little bit about this. And then, let's see, it was end of sophomore year. I heard about the, like this new program that was coming up. I'm like, okay. So like, I'll go try to like go to some of the meetings, see if it's like better than the work-based learning or the work experience that we have right now. And I quickly found out that this is definitely going to be a better program than the work experience previously that we had. So that kind of piqued my interest and I got more involved in it, started looking into potential jobs that they had through the CareerWise portal. So that really kind of piqued my interest to getting ahead now instead of just going into college early with having career and experience ahead of time. Graham, before COVID-19 hit, what was your day-to-day -day experience like as an apprentice? So as, an, uh, as a student and an uh, apprentice, so uh, in the mornings, I would go to class. Uh, for the first two blocks, I would do my classes, get everything done there. Then I would leave, go home, change into work attire, like button up, khakis, dress shoes. And then from practically 12 to 5, I would work at Chemcrest and then go home and then do my homework and schooling. So, yeah. <laughs> I understand things are a little bit different. Um, Travis, as an employer, how did COVID impact your company? And by extension, how have you had to adjust your, your youth apprenticeship program? Yeah, as Graham said, prior to COVID, um, he came in, you know, he was in office eight to five, um, just, just working in the office business as usual. Um, I take that back, not eight to five after school. Um, then COVID hit, we had to kind of readjust um, with his role um, being in the office setting, not in, say, a warehousing or production setting. Um, he, he was you know, able to, um, to perform his work from home. Um, so once COVID hit, obviously we all had to have flexibility, um, um, just as any, any associates kind of trying to find their way through this. Um, we found our way through it, through this program and with Graham. And um, um, it, it's, it's the same thing. He's doing his first couple blocks, you know, in school online through virtual e-learning. Um, then he's logging into work, and, um, just taking care of business as usual. Um, there is times where he, he does log in and out. So sometimes even he's, you know, get up and he's, he might be, you know, getting some reports done from seven to eight, even before he's getting into class or, or doing his schooling. Um, Mainly, the main thing is just, I mean, from a supervision standpoint, just, you know, just um, staying in touch, all working remote. So it's staying in touch, staying engaged, uh, making sure that he has work on his plate, which, which we always have work. And uh, just making sure that, that the communication is always there, just because we're working remote and we're not in office. Um, especially when we're talking about an apprenticeship program um, where there may be, you know, there may be a few more questions or more direction that's needed. Um, just being accessible to be ask those concerns or questions and uh, continue to guide him along. Um, fortunately with Graham, um, we did have the opportunity to, uh, for him to kind of learn his rule, ru rules and expectation before COVID hit. And um, I mean, he, he's pretty self-sufficient, but again, just, just staying in touch on a daily basis and uh, making sure that he has all the support that he needs. Um, but working from home, um, this will, I mean, he's just, he's learned a new skill set. Um, this is kind of new to our, to our workforce, um, where this could be a new way of doing business, you know, working remote and lowering your overhead. Um, so he's just going to be another step ahead of, of kids that are not taking advantage of this program. It's great to hear about all the support that you as an employer are offering um, Graham and, and, and other apprentices at this time. 
Um, Melissa and, and Brianna, I, I want to turn to you because you all are intermediaries. You support several youth apprenticeship programs across a number of industries. How have these programs been most affected by COVID-19 and how has your intermediary organization kind of assisted them in making sure there's continuity in programs for you? We'll start with uh, Brianna. You know, quite honestly, um, we were completely unsure if apprenticeship was even going to happen uh, post COVID because there were so many concerns and just so much unknown. You know, luckily we've been able to retain eight of our apprentices and we were able to successfully launch with eight new apprentices this year. And so, you know, that's exciting. And I attribute that to um, the very strong relationships that have been able to be developed uh, through being an intermediary and having that bird's eye view of all the partners um, and kind of trying to keep the best pulses possible of where they were at um, during, during this time when they were having to pivot and transition um, to still be able to um, make work happen. And so, you know, it, it took a lot for us as HEA and CareerWise of Clark County to constantly be in contact with our business partners, to constantly be in contact with our apprentices, um, just to see how their basic well-being was doing, um, really, you know, uh, to check in with them on that. But then also to see how are they making these adjustments that would still enable them to have apprentices in the workplace and then even for students to feel comfortable actually continuing to work. And also checking in with our educators um, because, you know, education was kind of flipped upside down a little bit. It, it has exposed some great opportunities for virtual learning, but, um, you know, many, many educators felt like they were new at trying to educate students. So we were able to um, see that and hear that and understand that, which then allowed us to be available to all of those partners um, during this time so that they could think through similar what Travis mentioned of how do we pivot to have students work remotely and what does that mean? Um, what does that look like? Um, or if they are in the at the workplace, what are the safety precautions that are needed in order to um, have them there? Uh, Melissa, I'm curious to hear your perspective perspective as um, not just an intermediary, but Trident Tech is the primary provider of related instruction. So what, what has the transition been like for a lot of the programs that you operate and support? You know, we felt like we had the proverbial apple cart loaded and we were rolling along and everything was great. And then on March 15th, our governor announced that, which was a Sunday, by the way, announced that all educational institutions were going virtual or shutting down. Monday morning. So <laughs> the world seemed like the whole apple cart had turned upside down and we immediately started scrambling to figure out what could this look like and how could this continue. And as you said, Lil, our students in the dual are, are duly enrolled at the college. So they are enrolled in the college classes in a career specific field taking college level courses. And so our number one concern, of course, was how do we continue to give them the quality job-related education or RTI, if you will, that they need in order to be successful in their apprenticeship program. So across the college, not just for the apprentices, but for all students, we moved everything virtual that we could possibly move to virtual learning. All of the folks in the labs, like the welding labs, were suddenly going in, the instructors were filming and doing really high quality video presentations of what they wanted the students to know and to learn. Some classes were able to complete themselves virtually. Our cybersecurity classes were able to continue our, um, and just a number of them were able to go on in a virtual environment. But those that needed the hand touch, you know, they needed to have those hands-on skills, we had to be creative with. And so we finished out everything we could finish out virtually in the spring. And then in the summer, when we were able to start coming back, we had staged all of our labs to be safe environments with spiritual, uh, spiritual listening to me, uh, with spatial distancing so that students could be spread out. And we went to open lab environments in many cases where the students 
reach out to the instructor and they sign up for a time in that lab and then they came in and they finished up the hands-on piece of the course that they needed to complete in a very safe way. So that was number one. Um, number two was making sure we kept touch with our apprentices because it was a very stressful time, not just academically, but in the workforce as well. We had students who were continuing employment in their workforce and some of them had concerns or their parents had concerns about their safety. And so we had to make sure we helped them to negotiate those pieces of that. We have a youth apprenticeship coordinator and a youth apprenticeship specialist. So they did ongoing touch with the students, phone calls, emails, keeping in touch with them, trying to find out their individual situations so that they could help navigate them through that. Some of our students got furloughed and they were panicked about that. And we assured them that the educational cost of their program would continue to be paid if they would just stay in their coursework. And then we would try to ensure that they had re-employment later, either with the same employee employer or with someone else if we could get that to continue that um, on the job training experience. So that was part of it. Some of the students um, went to home to work at home and they were handed laptops so that they could continue their bookkeeping accounting practices and were able to do the work virtually. We even had students in the CNA to pre-nursing program who were in hospitals and some of them were doing direct patient care with COVID individuals. So all of those contacts were being made. We were looking at them holistically. So some of them had real socio-emotional issues and we were connecting them with counseling services. So counseling services was helping them through that part of that as well. So all of these pieces were critical from the student's perspective. But we also have another unit in the college that's very employer facing. And so while our youth apprenticeship coordinator and specialist were reaching out to the students and their families and trying to provide them with ongoing support, we had the division of apprenticeship and the consultants were reaching out to the companies to find out what were their needs, what were their concerns, could they continue? So all of those pieces had to be taken care of. The other part of that was we had just launched the new hiring process for the upcoming year. And so we were suddenly very fearful, as Bree was, that this was going to be um, a turning point for us and how were we going to be able to get students hired for the upcoming cohort. But we were really fortunate. Some of our industries continued to hire. Some slacked off and said, we just can't participate next year. And for the healthcare industry, all of our hospitals were engaged in the work of trying to heal patients. And so our apprenticeship coordinator and our apprenticeship consultant from the um, apprenticeship division partnered together to do virtual interviews for all the students. And so they conducted virtual interviews and sent those to the hospitals and all the CNA to pre-nursing hires were done virtually this year from that interview stash. So those are just some of the things that we did. Those are some really helpful examples that you shared, Melissa and, and Brianna. Thank you so much um, for, for all the work that you're doing and, and for giving us that perspective here today. Graham, I want to I wanna go back to you. I mean, Travis brought up a really good point that you are, are building some soft skills and, and, and shifting to this remote environment. It's definitely something that will probably help you out in the long run. But I just want to hear from you, what, what has this transition um, been like for you? Did you have to navigate any complications in the, the shift to remote work and the adjustments to how you are participating in class? What, what did you experience as a, as a student and as an employee? So as a student, the transition, again, we originally thought of it, oh, it's only two weeks. This isn't going to be bad. Like, it's just all going to be like that. But then as it went on, it obviously shifted to fully online. So that switch from being in class every single day, every single day of the year, for the most part, was completely different. So we switched to, again, all virtual, which was a kind of a mess at first of how everything was organized and how we got our assignments and such. But as time went on, it got somewhat better, which was nice because organization for me and for all the other students is very important because we want to get these done because we don't want our grades to drop and fail since uh, me and a bunch of other classmates are in higher tier courses like AP honors and IB courses that this transition kind of 
stopped everything to a certain degree. And then with the apprenticeship part, from going one day of being in office and the next day not going back in for a good while was definitely interesting, definitely adapting to working at home and like communication wise. So my communication skills have gotten a lot better from not being able just to walk up to say Travis and ask him a question, rather emailing him or calling him or calling other coworkers to ask questions and to resolve issues. So this, the training on the job site has definitely become more involved with technical skills with like online, how to navigate our system, emailing new systems that we got. So it was just definitely interesting that quick transition of rather being sitting in, in like a conference room, having a training session for a new software piece to just on a phone call or on a Teams or on a Skype meeting. It was definitely interesting to say the least. Is, is quite the adjustment and I applaud you. I, I'm not sure too many people your age would be able to, to make that shift into Excel in the way that you have. So, so kudos to you. Um, I want to remind our audience that um, we are taking questions. If you have any questions, you can enter them into the um, Q&A feature or even in the chat box. We're aggregating them and we'll turn to them in just a moment. Um, but uh, uh, my next question, and, and maybe we can start with you, Graham, is what sort of advice do you have um, for um, youth apprenticeship stakeholders, leaders, education providers, employers, um, intermediaries who are um, supporting programs for youth? What sort of advice do you have for them? I think it's really important to center our work around student voices because they know <laughs> what works best for them and they have very unique experiences that sometimes we don't know about unless we ask them. So Graham, is there anything that you would share um, with the, the folks who are on today's summit um, as they're thinking about how to um, modify youth apprenticeship programs or even um, start new apprenticeship programs in the middle of um, a public health crisis that might continue for some time? So I would definitely say getting experience from the apprenticeships that are already in place, like the ones that we have, that I have with HEA. So they've reached out to me to speak and almost every single time I've taken that opportunity because I want to get the word out about this because this has changed a lot of things for me and has made me notice a lot of really good things about getting in the workforce in a career path that you really haven't thought of before. So whenever I have the opportunity to speak, I always do so to get the word out, to help spread it in my experience, because my experience has been absolutely amazing with ChemCrest and HEA on both parts. So definitely hearing the youth voice that are in the program, just getting that out so when other kids kind of know, oh, so he's having a good experience. I hope that he is kind of sharing his word and hopefully I can pursue that as well. I think that's excellent advice, Graham. I want to open it up to our, our other panelists. What advice do you have um, for youth apprenticeship leaders to make sure that they're supporting student apprentices during these unusual times? And I'll go with whoever wants to unmute themselves first. Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I would say that you really need to create really strong collaborative partnerships ahead of time so that when these critical issues hit, you have a team of partners who work collaboratively to really move it forward. Um, be flexible. It takes a lot of flexibility in looking at the problems and figuring out what they were and then coming up with creative ideas in that collaborative space to say, yes, let's try this to tackle it so that um, nothing is off the table. Everything is an opportunity for further development of your programs. And then I would say really depend on building a strong backbone for your partnership or your organizational structure. You have to have a strong intermediary who can keep all those disparate pieces working together in that collaborative space. Um, we were able to get 47 students hired this summer. 
and we did not know that that was even going to be possible in the midst of COVID. But it was that partnership mentality that I think really helped us move that forward in, in a constructive way. I would add that um, it's very important to stay connected to those apprentices in establishing a sense of community because we're now in a day where it's become more of a challenge to be in person with people. Um, finding creative and innovative ways to use technology to, to keep them together to help with retention and to help, you know, share resources and kind of understand the challenges that um, they may be experiencing balancing school and work and e-learning and not being with with people. And then I think the other one, um, other thing I would share is kind of take a look at some of the pre-training or pre-onboarding that apprentices um, may need before jumping into apprenticeship. For example, you know, COVID has, uh, has showcased how critical technology and the use of technology is and how to use computers and different softwares. And so is there opportunity to begin to embed some of those technical or technology um, certifications or pre-trainings to kind of help students ha start at a good point um, in their apprenticeship to be able to utilize those. And then, you know, I, I would end with just saying just start, you know, especially for those who are on the fence of not sure of how and when. Um, of course, you want the framework to be, uh, to be good quality um, and try to think to have parameters in place, of course, but start. Start somewhere because as Graham says, when you begin hearing those stories um, from apprentices and when you begin um, strengthening those partnerships with employers and hear the stories that they share about how the youth have impacted in their um, facilities, it, it definitely shows that it's a, a needed opportunity and can definitely make a difference. You know, I would just piggyback off of what Brianna said just start. Um, we were part of the initial launch launch here in Elkhart County, um, kind of feeling our way through this initial launch. And if, if we're a willing partner, we're, we're willing to, to go through the learning pains with the program. Um, we want to be a part of it. We want to help grow it. And um, we're, we're fortunate enough to, to have Graham and to benefit from the program as well. Um, it's, it's, just not a, it's just not a benefit to, to Graham, to the apprenticeship, whoever's involved. It's also, a, you know, a benefit to the, to the employer and the company as well. So I would encourage anybody to get involved no matter what stage it's in. Um, you can be in the forefront and you can, you can help develop the program wherever you're at. If I can add a couple of things I thought of, Lul. Um, one of the things that I think made it really beneficial for us or it made it possible for us to continue to move this forward was that when we did start, we started this as a sector partnership. So we didn't rely on one employer. We had a group of employers. So if one employer now is struggling with the whole COVID and has to fall out, it doesn't collapse the whole program because you have others to sustain it. And I think the other thing that I would add is don't hesitate to ask for help. There are organizations and philanthropic uh, entities out there who are willing to help. You know, we discovered in the midst of this that some of our students really just didn't have the computers at home capable of really doing the work, especially in the engineering program, the CAD work that they needed to do. They just were not equipped to do what they needed to do. But we have a philanthropist now who wants to stash us with a lending library of computers we can put into their hands. Well, what a great benefit to these students and to the employers, to us. So reach out to whoever you have in your local community and build it collectively. The more collaborative you can be, the stronger you're going to be as a group. Thanks, Melissa, and, and thanks for all the advice. I want to build on the last point that you um, made, Melissa. We, we have a question from the audience 
Um, how has your engagement with employers changed due to COVID, specifically around employer recruitment and pitching to uh, new potential partners? What is resonating and what do employers need to come to the table um, and be supported right now? Um, so we heard a little bit from you, Melissa, but I definitely want to invite um, Brianna to, to share. And, and Melissa, if you have any other thoughts you want to add to that question. Yeah, you know, we have um, been, we're currently in our recruitment season now. And so, you know, we're, we're having to approach it a little differently in that, um, you know, we set up Zoom meetings instead of being able to sit right with the HR manager or with um, the CEO or president to talk about this opportunity. But I, what's interesting is even though we are in challenging times, employers are are actually still interested in these opportunities um, because there's still a talent shortage. Um, there still is a, a gap and there still needs to be a pipeline uh, developed to fill those open positions that are going to be forthcoming and even to um, bring in new talent for the new positions that are developed um, out of COVID. And so you know, we've had pretty good success of being able to still get in front of employers and talk about youth apprenticeship as a talent strategy and, and, and a little bit as an economic recovery strategy uh, during, during these times. Uh. Brianna, you mentioned you, you've had you've had some success in uh, messaging the importance of youth apprenticeship to employers. The, the next question we have um, relates to how you measure success. Um, so from the audience we're hearing, what do you measure as a baseline of success? What does success look like in general and how do you measure it? And how has your vision for success changed in response to COVID? And anybody can answer that question. You're trying to measure success now. It took us a while to get to where we really had some sufficient outcome data, but we're, we're collecting all the data on retention of students from one class to the next, success rate in the courses they're taking, completion of the two-year program, all of those types of things. And what we've discovered is that the youth apprentices are twice as likely to complete their college curriculum and finish the program as traditional students in the exact same career specific classes during the exact same time frames. So when you look at that, it's pretty astounding in terms of the success of the program. And we attribute that to the fact that we're triangulating around these students. You know, the employers are a huge asset in their support and their educational component. The K-12 system is there to support and assist them and then the college as well. And so the three of us, the three entities working together really help, I think, to keep that student moving forward in a productive way and address their individual issues. Um, Graham may be able to, to give you some insight on that. So when I think about how to determine success with this program, it's kind of talking about, and personally I think this, is how your, your skills have really developed and changed. So if I were to look back on my communication skills, responsiveness, time management, last year to when I first started to now, they're completely different of how efficient I am with processing, getting back to people, getting stuff done, making sure I don't uh, miss anything. Sometimes I do, just it happens every once in a while. But with measuring success, you can't measure it with everybody on the exact same scale. It's different for everybody, every person out there, that it can't just be ABC. It has to adapt to who that person is, what their skills are, and how kind of it kind of ties into their morals as well. And that's what I think personally on how you measure success. And uh, that, that is true. Um, Graham, I like how you mentioned it. It does vary um, on each person's success and, and what they determine that is. You know, from a programmatic standpoint, we try to put um, some parameters in place to help with that. So having a uh, set of competencies in which the students 
are able to go through and we, um, you know, orient the businesses with which they've actually had input into those uh, competencies as well. And much of what uh, Melissa is speaking about the related training, the education component, and so kind of outlining what that path may look like for some of those students to access those courses and, and what degrees or certifications it may lead to. And so that helps us kind of look at um, if the program is meeting those expectations is how well those students um, and the employers and even our educators are helping each person get through each step. Um, you know, we, we do surveys to our employers and our apprentices to check um, on their satisfaction as well. I think it's important to hear um, what their satisfactory is at any point within the program for us to be able to know how to adjust um, or to continue, um, you know, continue the processes that are developed. And you all have um, shared many helpful examples of how you've pivoted to adapt your programming in the spring and in the summer. And I know it's uh, it's a bit cliche now to, to be saying that this crisis is presenting opportunities for innovation, but are there strategies that you have introduced in response to COVID that you'll preserve um, even as things start to, to go back to normal? Are there new approaches or processes that you think will make your program better in the long run that you've, um, you know, recently implemented because of COVID? For our, our new cohort, um, we implemented a asynchronous um, training, virtual training. Uh, whereas before we were doing that all in person and live and, and there are some live components to it, but um, yeah, providing that asynchronous opportunity for students to do pre-training um, prior to going into youth apprenticeship on communication, on ethics, on email, um, etiquette and communication, self-branding, self-advocacy, um, things like that. So we're, we have implemented that and um, are looking forward to continuing that as an option for students. And I'm pretty sure that our youth friendship coordinator and uh, specialist would tell you that they intend to continue doing virtual meetings with students and their families, the apprentices and their families on a regular basis because they found that so helpful in just having that touch base. It can be requested by the family or it could be requested by the coordinator just to, to touch base and make sure that everything is going smoothly. And I do know that we were so successful with the virtual interview scenario with the health industry that we are entertaining doing virtual interviews with every industry sector that can be offered as an alternative to employers who find themselves extremely busy and not able to do necessarily interviews in person. And so it could be an alternative for them. It would not, and it, the other part of that is it also gives the student a taste of the interview before the employer might actually interview them should they choose to do that. So we think that that'll be an ongoing practice for us. Travis, is there anything you would add? How have you as an employer are doing things differently now that you are, are not going to be quick to let go of once things get back to normal? Um, not necessarily. I guess what I would add would just be that, I mean, um, you guys, it sounds like you guys are doing your part to transition and change the program a little bit to accommodate current times. Um, while it doesn't always, it's not always necessarily, you know, for the employer to accommodate, it definitely helps with those partnerships and to get with the right companies and those companies in your community that take pride in, in participating in these type of community involvement because they're also going to help put into this program and they're going to help make it a success as well. It's not going to be one-sided. Um, that's what I would have to add. I think that's a great addition. I know we're nearing the, the end of our, our session. Um, we unfortunately won't get to all the questions, but maybe the last one that we could touch on is 
How have you helped uh, the apprentice supervisors, teachers, and other mentors adapt to this current environment and continue to support apprentices? We just say that what we've done is to keep that constant communication stream going. You know, trying to find out where there are issues or problems and then working collectively and collaboratively to address those. The communication, I think, has just been enhanced because we have had to be distant. And it's interesting because it's almost like we're being brought closer within the distance that this virus has caused. Trying to stay abreast on the different ways to interact through technology, um, kind of trying to be the lead almost in that, um, in that support, because that is the way that we're able to stay connected. And so, um, you know, if, if we're able to set up an interview or to um, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the counselor and apprentice and employer to kind of be that focal point to, to bring that together through technology um, is definitely something that we're trying to keep at the forefront for us. Well, I just want to thank our amazing panelists Graham, thank you so much for carving time out of your very busy work and school day. Thank you, Melissa and Brianna and Travis um, for sharing your perspectives as well. This is not easy work and you guys are doing it on a day-to-day -day basis under um, conditions that are very unusual. And so really um, compliment you on your persistence and thank you for giving us a glimpse uh, into what you all are doing. And then hopefully we could take these lessons back to our own communities and, and apply them to make sure that we are elevating youth apprenticeship as uh, an equitable economic mobility strategy, even in these um, very difficult times. So many thanks to you.